Minds of mine, the fanatic Melanie's mind so great you can't have it Melanie's mind, the mind of fanatic Melanie's mind's the great you can't have it Hello everyone, it's been a while and honestly I'm gonna full heartedly blame Corona and the quarantine and being on lockdown because I don't know if it's just me But I've been feeling completely unmotivated. I've just been finding it really hard to find inspiration I've had this story on the back burner and I've had all the research done I just have been really unmotivated to film it and so here I am bringing it to you guys today and it is the Berkeley hostage crisis of 1990 so I remember this story completely blew me away when I first heard it because hostages are to me, something really rare. I don't hear about them very often. And when I do see them or hear about them, it's usually in movies. So to know that hostages really happen in real life is really scary to me because you could be out at the store or just having a completely normal day and all of a sudden you're being held hostage. And that's pretty much what happened to these victims of this hostage situation. They were just having a very, very normal night and then this incident happened. Before I start, I just want to give credit to where I got a lot of my information. And so the first place that I got a lot of my information from was an article from Berkeley side. And it was an article remembering the incident 20 years later. And that had a, a lot of detail and a lot of really good information. If you guys want to check it out, I'll link it down below. I also got a lot of information from the My Favorite Murder podcast, episode 73, where... Karen Kilgariff actually goes into depth about this incident and I would highly recommend either reading that article or listening to that podcast because they're very informative and really, really good. On September 26, 1990, Murdad Doshti and his friend decided to go out to a bar, but most importantly, Doshti wanted to go to a bar that was filled with white American women with blonde hair. So they decided to go to Henry's Bar that was in the lobby of the Durant Hotel in Berkeley, California. And this hotel, and this bar, was really, really close to the college campus of Berkeley. And because this bar was so close to the college campus, it was usually filled with college students. And the type of students that usually came to this bar were the sorority type, so lots of sorority girls and frat boys. And so right before midnight, Dashti opens fire to the bar, injuring six people and killing one and holding over 33 people hostage. So before all this happened, I want to talk to you guys about Murdad Dashti's early life. So Dashti was born in Iran, but came to the United States when he was 12 years old. And four years prior to this incident, he had actually graduated from Berkeley with a degree in engineering. But even though he had this degree in engineering, he could not get a job that he wanted. He couldn't get any job with that degree, so he ended up having to become a carpenter just to make ends meet. And I can only imagine that that was very devastating for him because he spent all this time and effort getting this degree just to come out of it at the end, probably in debt. So I believe that this made him feel like his dreams were crushed and that he felt like he was working a job that was beneath him. And actually a year before he graduated, he got married to his girlfriend that he had been dating for a while and she was an American woman, but because he could not get a job with his engineering degree, they started to fight a lot about their financial struggles and also he became extremely controlling of her so she decided to divorce him and then he was just living alone in his apartment really depressed and feeling crushed because he couldn't find a job with his degree and because his relationship had failed what no one knew and maybe Doshti didn't even really know but police later found out it was that Doshti was a paranoid schizophrenic and he was hearing voices during the time that everything was failing for him, he started to hear voices and he would fight with the voices and he would argue and talk to them. And it's really unsure to know if he was aware that he had a mental illness because he never got treated for it and never went to get treated for it, but he really played into the voices in his head. So all this bad stuff going on in Doshti's life, his divorce, not being able to get a job that he wants, and then also being a paranoid schizophrenic, all leads to September 26, 1990. Like I said, he had told his friend that he wanted to go to a bar that had a lot of American women that had blonde hair specifically. I'm not really sure why that was something that he wanted in specific, but that's why they went to Henry's bar that night. 
And like I told you guys, it was going to be filled with sorority girls and frat boys, so there were a lot of blonde-haired American women. So I'm pretty sure that they get to a bar when they're kind of doing the last calls. So Doshti's friend went to go get them drinks, and when Doshti's friend went to go do that, Doshti went back out to the car, and he came back with a suitcase. And in that suitcase, he had a Mac pistol, an automatic pistol that was Uzi-like, and he also had a handgun with him. And he also had 450 rounds of ammunition. At around 12.05, he began shooting randomly inside the bar. And half of the people either fell to the ground to take cover or ran outside of the bar. And during this time is actually when about eight people got shot. And the whole time that Doshti was shooting, he was yelling, I don't want to kill anyone. I don't want to kill anyone. And after the dust has settled, he said, if you're injured, leave. He let anyone that was injured leave the bar. So like I said, Doshti had automatic pistols with him. So one woman actually had gotten shot eight times throughout her body. And she had one not felt it until she felt her side and saw that there was blood. And she literally just got up and walked out because Doshti said if you're injured you can leave and there was also a guy that got shot in the chest and two guys pleaded with Doshti for him to let them escort him out because he couldn't get out of the bar by himself and he agreed for them to take him out as long as they promised that they would return back but clearly they were not going to do that one thing that was fortunate though was that there was a patrol officer nearby and he heard what he thought were fireworks but he still went to go check it out and that's when he saw a whole bunch of people running out of henry's bar and right away he called it in and in a matter of minutes, there was a bunch of ambulance and police cars, and SWAT was called right away. It doesn't take long for the bar to be surrounded, and Doshti is smart enough to start lining up the hostages amongst the windows so that the police do not have a clear view of him or what's going on inside, and they also can't take a clear shot at him because they would risk the lives of the hostages. Once all this commotion was happening, one of the people that actually was able to run out of the bar was the friend that Doshti had came with. And he went up to police and he told him everything he knew about Doshti, where he lived, his name, everything. And it didn't take long for police to get a search warrant to Doshti's house. And that's where they found out that he had gone a divorce, that he was living alone and pretty crappy conditions and police had actually found a bunch of letters that Doshti had written to the government and had written to the police department about the voices in his head and one of the letters was actually for the Berkeley Police Department and it said that they owed Doshti 16 trillion dollars for his psychic abilities because he believed that the voices in his head were the government and he was listening to everything that they were doing and everything that they were saying and he was being obedient so that they owed him all this money for listening to them. And the crazy thing is, is that hours before the incident happened, Doshi had actually called the Berkeley Police Department complaining about a warrant that he had received in the mail for his arrest for a prior incident that he had committed and he was also complaining to them about the voices in his head and the compensation he deserved and everything that they had owed him for his psychic abilities and the dispatcher stayed on the line with him for a really long time just hearing him out but obviously really nothing was done after that phone call the reason that he had a warrant out for his arrest is because the prior year he had actually stolen blank checks from a bakery and he tried to take seventeen thousand dollars using those blank checks but obviously he was caught and when he was questioned, he had told police that he was not in control of what the voices in his head told him to do. He also said that he felt that by obtaining the money, he was paying himself for all the favors and everything he was doing for the government, for the voices in his head, and for pretty much listening to everything that they said to him and told him to do. Also, two years earlier, police had found him responsible for hitting 43 luxury cars that were parked with his own car. And once he was apprehended, he had once again told police that the voices in his head told him to do it and that the government owed him all this money for all the work that he had been doing for them. But because of this incident, the police actually had to strip search him and i'm not really sure if that was necessary at all for them to do but the really bad thing about this strip search is that one he is extremely mentally ill two it was very demeaning and all he had done was hit cars like maybe he was acting weird so they thought he was on drugs or something but it didn't really make sense for police to have to strip search him 
I'm sorry if the lighting or the energy or and or anything from this point on is a little bit off my camera died So I'm just gonna try to pick up where I left off So once Dashti had all the people lined up He told all the non-caucasian women that were in the bar that they could leave and to go out and tell the police that this was happening Because it was their fault and everything that was happening was essentially their fault He then proceeds to tell all the pretty blonde women to come to the center of the bar and once they're at the center of the bar he has the male hostages sexually harass them and molest them and some of the things i read is that he had the male hostages anally penetrate the women with carrots which is really odd and he had actually brought the carrots with him and some men had actually tried to fake it um and were able to turn their bodies away so that Dashti couldn't really get a look at what they were doing. He also carried out fake executions and used the hostages as shields. He also makes one of the male hostages break a window so that there's the ability to communicate with the police to the inside. And he had that hostage sit there and be the person that would send the message out. And the crazy thing about all this is that all of this was on live TV. Once this whole ordeal started happening, a bunch of news stations came down to the bar and were reporting live what was happening and a bunch of people got to see all of this live. So they actually have footage of this hostage breaking the window and they also have just the footage of this whole entire train wreck. And this was really bad of the media's part because as you'll see later on, the media had a really big part in this whole incident because they went live and Dashti was watching the news as he was in the bar and because they were reporting everything on the spot he was able to know what the police were going to do what was going on outside of there and they pretty much kept him up to date so one of Dashti's demands was that he wanted the police chief Frank Jordan to go on live television and strip from the waist down and he wanted this because he wanted the police to feel as humiliated as they had made him feel when he had to be strip searched Dashti also demanded $16 trillion and said that he would also take California, Oregon, and Nevada as payment. One hostage, John Landa, actually said the scariest thing was hearing Dashti's demands and knowing that they were n not feasible at all and that it could only end badly because the police are, were not going to be able to give him anything or even a little bit of what he was demanding. The negotiators kept telling Dashti that they needed more time, but the negotiators knew that there was really nothing else that they could do. There was no coming to a compromise, and Dashti was only going to let the hostages go if he got his demands met and saw it on the news. By 4 a.m., Dashti is really frustrated because nothing is getting done, and he looks around the hostages and says, it looks like I'm gonna have to kill someone who is gonna die. And all the hostages are college students, so they're just looking around at each other in disbelief and you know, just seeing what's gonna happen. And one brave soul, one male hostage, steps forward and volunteers and says that he volunteers to be shot so that no one else has to. But he asked Dashti if he can go out and tell the police what's about to happen to him. And Dashti says yes, and so the male goes out and lets police know, I'm about to be executed. And then he goes back inside and asks Dashti if he could say a prayer before he's shot, and Dashti says yes. And everyone is very quiet and some people look away or some people, you know, are just staring. And then Dashti shoots up into the ceiling and once the dust settles, the male is still standing there. And it just goes to show that Dashti wasn't planning on hurting anyone. He didn't really want to kill anyone. He really didn't want to hurt anyone. He just wanted his demands met. And it just goes to show how mentally ill he was because he wasn't really trying to do something malicious. It was malicious, but he was just thinking this is what he needed to do to get his money. So because of the media and the fact that all these newscasters were there reporting everything live, it made police have no control over the situation because anything that they reported, Dashti was seeing. And so the media had actually found out that Dashti was a schizophrenic and reported it to everyone so that everyone could hear and Dashti got really really upset and agitated when he found out this news and that made the whole situation a lot worse for Dashti and for the hostages they kept swaying with Dashti's emotions because he would go from angry to mumbling to himself and so many things were throwing him off so police thought it would be a good idea to put snipers on the building that was across from the bar on the roof. And when the snipers were up there, they thought that the street lights 
could show Doshti that they were up there and they would freak him out. So they decided to shoot out the street lights so it would be dark, but that just made Doshti even more paranoid and angry and it made the situation a lot worse. And so at 5 a.m. Doshti told the bartender to give everyone that was held hostage four beers and for everyone to have a good time. And the hostages say that they felt their heart really heavy when he said that because they knew that Doshti wanted them to be drunk and be having a good time before their demise, before they all died. And also at this time, the news had reported that John Sheehy had actually died and this was the male that got shot in the chest by Doshti. And when the news came out, he began yelling, I didn't kill him, I didn't kill him, they're lying. It's the government, they're lying. They want everyone to think I'm a bad person. I didn't kill him. And he was going crazy hearing the news that he had killed someone because like I said, he really did not intend to hurt anyone. He wasn't trying to cause anyone else any harm. He just wanted what he thought was owed to him. So at around 7 a.m., the negotiation team knew that they couldn't get anything done and decided that they had to do a diversion tactic because like I said, this bar was so close to campus and they knew that college students were going to start coming by and they couldn't do anything to get college students from coming close to the bar. So at 7.23 a.m., Swalt rolls in a flash canister into the bar and one team makes sure that all the hostages are able to get out while the other team's looking for Doshti. And as all this is happening, Doshti grabs his gun and starts lunging toward a group of hostages and at that point is where police shot him 24 times. He was taken to the hospital and died on the way to the hospital. And this incident is described as one of the most successful hostage rescue operations because as they were rescuing the hostages, no other hostages were injured or shot in the process of trying to get to Doshti. And the crazy thing is that the media at times were giving uncooperated details to everyone because they were just trying to keep the story going. And one news station had actually announced SWAT's plan to do a diversion tactic, and the only reason that Doshti hadn't seen it is because he wasn't watching that news channel, but if he was, he would have been more prepared for the attack, and he probably would have killed a lot more hostages before SWAT was able to come in. And that is the hostage crisis of 1990 in Berkeley, California. And it is still one of the craziest stories that I have ever heard, ever done research on. It's just crazy to think that you could be having a really normal night with your friends and then in an instant, in the blink of an eye, it could be one of the most traumatic days of your life. And the story to me is also just extremely sad. If he had just gone out and gotten the help that he needed, this could have been completely avoided. And that's why I think it's so important to check up on your friends and your family and, you know, just to make sure that, you know, everyone's doing okay, everyone's feeling okay. But I hope that you guys enjoyed this story and, you know, it didn't freak you guys out too much. But I hope you guys are having a really safe quarantine and that, you know, the lockdown's almost over for your city, where you are, and just that you know, everyone's staying safe. I appreciate you guys so much. We just got to 1,200 subscribers and I'm so thankful for you guys. I really would not be doing this without you guys. So I just appreciate you guys and until the next video, goodbye.